Um, my name is Carl or Kalle, uh, and uh, I studied at KTH here in Stockholm, um, computer science or and engineering physics. So previously, I worked as a security consultant at Bitsec, a um, company which no longer exists or got bought by the Finnish uh, Nixu. And but uh, roughly two years ago, I um, switched and have since then been working as the head of security at uh, Kryn. Uh, so I play a lot of these uh, CTF competitions that I'm going to talk about together with um, our team, Hacking for Sodium, um, where we are primarily a Swedish uh, team with uh, a few other people as well. I have one team member here with me today, uh, Lars, uh, and we are currently ranked in the kind of like unofficial world ranking. We are the 12th best team in the world at the moment. Um, so, and if you want to get in contact with me uh, after this presentation at a later time, uh, you can um, use one of these uh, methods. And uh, I'm also just going to, uh, you know, uh, promote my like website and blog and my YouTube channel where I do some live streams and uh, other kind of videos about security. So on Saturday, we're going to do um, something that we call uh, pony racing. Uh, so it's um, kind of like an e-sportification of the uh, um, capture the flag um, competitions, where four players will be uh, racing against each other uh, to solve the, the same challenge, while we are providing like live commentary and analysis of uh, what they're doing. Um, it's the third time we're doing it; it's been hugely successful so far, and um, yeah, people of, of all different skill levels have said that it was. Uh, very uh, both entertaining and, and educational. So um, check that out. Uh, anyway, let's get into the uh, topic. So uh, capture the flag is basically a form of competitive hacking. Uh, it's a way to test your technical uh, security skills uh, against yourselves or against uh, others. So um, there are various uh, forms uh, of this, but like the common thing is that you have a bunch of challenges uh, which you're uh, supposed to uh, overcome uh, based on uh, problems in in the field of like IT security and cryptography and related uh, fields. So uh, typically these challenges uh, are within one of these uh, categories, which I'm going to explain uh, what they are, uh, and uh, they can also be like other challenges which are not that doesn't really fit into the typical uh, like categorization of these challenges uh, and sometimes challenges are kind of like a hybrid uh, thing between these uh, categories so you might need both like web hacking skills and cryptography skills to uh, solve a particular challenge and uh, you can compete in these uh, competitions uh, as an individual uh, or with a team and uh, uh, it's typically very nice to like play in a team because both because uh, typically you have you know different skill sets different things that you like and uh, you can learn a lot from each other and it's a nice uh, social activity to participate in these competitions together either you know playing online together or actually like meet up uh, and you know sit down and play these competitions uh, together it's a really um, like fun and educational uh, activity and um, these competitions can be uh, like actual competitions, like time uh, box. Typically, they run for like 24 or 48 uh, hours. Uh, some of them run for a bit longer, like one or two weeks. Uh, and uh, that's what we typically mean when we talk about uh, capture the flag or CTF for short. Uh, then there is basically a similar thing, but without any like time constraints. So there are websites where you just permanently have like a database of challenges that you can attempt. And these are typically called uh, war games. But it's essentially, it's like the types of challenges and the type of skills uh, is, is basically the same. It's just whether it's like an actual time boxed competition or just, you know, challenges that you can practice in your own uh, pace at any time. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about these uh, different uh, categories that you might uh, encounter uh, in a capture the flag competition and what different skills uh, they will uh, test you on. So one with 
maybe the most uh, cryptic name uh, is what's called a, a pwnable, so uh, which comes from the you know hacking slang pwn, which comes from own. So it's uh, it's about uh, exploiting uh, software and hardware um, to do something that it was probably not intended uh, to do. And typically, uh, this is um, primarily focused on low-level uh, codes, like machine code running directly on uh, your like hardware or whatever uh, platform. So it's uh, like x86 or ARM um, or MIPS or any other uh, architecture. That's uh, typically the, the type uh, of problems uh, or the types of programs that you would encounter, which, uh, which are the subject of these challenges. So uh, the basic setup that you typically would encounter is that uh, you get a copy of a program which does something. Let's say it's like a, it's some like made up library service where you can like borrow and return uh, fictional books. Uh, so you get a copy of this compiled uh, program which you can run on your own computer. But then the same program is also running uh, on a server uh, remotely. So the idea then is that you are to analyze this program, find uh, one or more bugs, uh, vulnerabilities uh, in this program, and uh, with these vulnerabilities you can uh, turn them into, uh, you can develop an exploit uh, for this program, which allows you to take over the control of the program and make it do uh, something other than you know, borrowing and returning uh, books. For example, just give you a shell on the server where you can do whatever you want. Uh, and then you typically there is a text file on the server uh, with a with a password in it, which is what's called the flag. And then you you get this flag. You you develop your exploit. You connect to the remote server. Uh, you use your exploit to take control over the program so that you can read the text file. You get the password and you submit this to the competition system, and you have solved the challenge. So that's the uh, the most common uh, setup uh, for this. Sometimes. The setup is that you you get access to a remote server, but as a low privileged uh, user, and you're supposed to use some kind of vulnerability or exploit to uh, escalate your privileges while already being on on the machine. So that's a, a variant uh, of this, and um, it can be like regular uh, user landed programs, and sometimes it can be like kernel exploitation uh, challenges, and it doesn't even have to be. Um, low-level uh, code. Sometimes these challenges are about like Java programs or Python programs and so on. But the absolutely most, uh, by far most common types of are these uh, low-level uh, programs. And uh, uh, yeah, some of the, like what kind of tools uh, you would use is you would first need some kind of like reverse engineering tools to be able to pick the program apart and analyze it to, you know, get an understanding and find these bugs. Uh, and you would use something like uh, IDA, Binary Ninja, the newly released NSA tool, uh, Ghidra, a really, really cool uh, free tool. Um, there's an open source um, reverse engineering framework called uh, Radara, which is uh, powerful but kind of difficult to use. Um, so, um, yeah, as a beginner, I would t definitely recommend to check out uh, Ghidra. It's uh, uh, free and really powerful. And supposedly what the NSA is using internally when they are analyzing programs. So, I mean, if it's good enough for them, it's probably good enough for you. Uh, so this is what we call the static analysis of a program. We just, you're looking at the code, taking it apart, trying to understand it. You also want to like run the program and analyze to see what it does, uh, to do some dynamic analysis where you would use some debugger like GDB. Uh, there's a nice like plugin called Pwn Debug, which gives you a lot of extra uh, features which helps out with these uh, types of uh, operations. And then uh, there would be a lot of like, when you're building these exploits, it's very common to use uh, Python for uh, scripting. It's a very uh, well-suited uh, language for this uh, because uh, it's like, hits a really nice sweet spot between like being very productive and there's a lot of different libraries available for different things. Um, so typically there's a lot of Python uh, involved in this. Um, and yeah, this is a bit what it can look like while you're analyzing a program it's running. So this is a screenshot from a debugger uh, while you're trying to corrupt some memory of this program. Um, 
So another category is uh, reverse engineering. So I talked a little bit about reverse engineering when I talked about Ponables, uh, but then, so with Ponables, the idea is you know you use the reverse engineering as kind of like a pre-step to build an exploit uh, for the program. So typically in a Ponable challenge, the reversing part is typically not that difficult. There is no, has been very little or no effort to like obfuscate or make it hard to uh, analyze uh, the program. While in the reverse engineering category, uh, the reverse engineering is, uh, I mean, as the name suggests, uh, the focus of the exercise. So you typically, uh, there, may, there are different um, subcategories of this. You can be reverse engineering uh, software, um, different network uh, protocols, or even hardware in some uh, competitions. But uh, a very common setup for this is something called a CrackMe, which is uh, a program uh, that you're supposed to give, you're supposed to give it the correct answer as an input, and then the program will tell you if it was the correct answer or not. So by taking the program apart and analyzing the code uh, and looking at the like algorithm and mechanism that determines if it's correct or not, you can work your way backwards to figure out what the correct input uh, is. Uh, and uh, here, I mean, this can range from like very simple challenges where um, there's some, you know, just some extremely primitive uh, encryption uh, algorithm, um, which you can, you know, quickly reverse engineer. Or this can be uh, like layers of layers of uh, um, code that modifies itself and unpacks uh, further pieces of code or downloads further pieces of code from the internet and, you know, mutates itself while it's running. Um, yeah, so, or even like a virtual machine where they have implemented this kind of like their own programming language, which you have to then disassemble and uh, understand. Um, so, uh, this is uh, actually probably my favorite uh, category. I think it's very, uh, it's a very nice um, thing to sit with because you kind of can always make some kind of progress. You can always like, figure out something about a little bit uh, more about the code and understand what it's doing and like slowly making progress and then you finally get that breakthrough which will make you understand like the whole everything uh, like falls together which is so nice and when it comes to tooling it's pretty much the same as with the um, with the exploitation uh, you need some kind of static analysis uh, tool to look at the code uh, you need some kind of dynamic analysis tool to like debug the program and run it and analyze its behavior, uh, and there will be yeah a lot of Python uh, scripting to you know put all the pieces together. Um, yeah, so um, the web category, and this is uh, possibly the category which I think. A lot of people start out because this is what a lot of people are uh, familiar with, where they have their uh, background. I think um, a lot of security is done in, in like the web uh, domain today, so that would this is what people have like studied and worked with a lot. And uh, um, the web category is it's also a very uh, broad. Uh, category typically like the setup is that you get some some website uh, which then intentionally has some kind of vulnerability and you're supposed to you know figure out the vulnerability hack the website and get this password the flag it can be for example stored as a text file on the server or maybe as a row in the database or maybe you know there's like an internal service further down intern uh, internally, which uh, contains the um, uh, flag. And um, yeah, so you have the you know all the like classical uh, server side uh, web attacks, like you know, SQL injections and uh, deserialization and XCC things, other kinds of like template inj injection attacks. And uh, the websites are typically you know written in the languages that you typically find your website like PHP, Python, Java. Um, but of course, this is like the, the standard or most common setup, but you can find all kinds of weird things. I think once we encountered some, it was a whole website written in Bash. Um, that was interesting. Um, so um, yeah, that's a little bit about like the server side attack, which is 
possibly what you like primarily think of when like you think about hacking your website. Uh, but there are also like uh, client side uh, attack challenges where you're supposed to perform some uh, XSS or uh, CSRF or other kind of uh, attacks towards a client. Um, so there you typically have a setup where uh, there's like an automated, uh, like a headless browser or something. So you give it a URL and it visits the URL and by using, for example, an XSS uh, vulnerability in the website, you get the this browser to uh, disclose uh, the flag. Maybe uh, it has it in a cookie or it has, it has access to a page of the website that you don't have access to. Um, and yeah, so for for this category, you would use your you know everyday web um, hacking tools. I mean, Burp Suite's a very popular uh, choice. It's like a um, web like an uh, attack proxy and a web application hacking framework, um, which is um, yeah really powerful. Uh, there's a free like community version, and then there's like a professional version uh, of it. Uh, another popular tool for doing automating like uh, SQL injection is uh, SQL map. And again, as with the other categories, uh, you know, usually maybe the, the, the attack chain consists of doing multiple steps. Like maybe you're first supposed to go to this site to set up some state and, you know, you go to some other page to trigger something. So you typically, you want to script this to automate it because you typically want to like iterate on this. So again, you, want to use some kind of scripting language like uh, Python uh, to perform these uh, attacks. Uh, cryptography is another very, uh, one of the standard categories, which is, I think, maybe the category that it really divides people into people with an academic background and people without an academic background, uh, typically. I mean, this is, you know, just like a general rule of thumb, because uh, here um, it, it, it requires some understanding of uh, mathematics, typically. Not all kinds of cryptography challenges, but uh, a lot of them. Uh, so um, it can be, it's sometimes a little bit, um, you know, frightening to people without uh, a background in, in cryptography or uh, mathematics. Uh, but I think it's, actually a bit like unwarranted. Uh, there is uh, tons of materials uh, online about like everything from the like the very basics uh, of cryptography and the, like the mathematics you need to understand uh, and so on. So it's you know you really don't have to have you know studied at, uh, at the university to understand this uh, but you know some mathematical understanding will of course help you. Mm. Um, the typical scenarios that you're looking here is at this um, you might have that someone has implemented their own uh, encryption scheme, like come up with some, you know, their completely own way of encrypting data. And you have to like analyze this algorithm and figure out the flaw in it to be able to break this decryption to either recover an encrypted message or the key that was used to uh, encrypt a message. Uh, mm -hmm. You can also have something where you have some kind of um, uh, signature, some kind of um, signing uh, scheme. So maybe you're supposed to forge some signature and you're able to do this because the algorithm that creates or verifies the signature is broken in some way. Uh, there might be setups where they have basically taken some kind of academic paper which describes some cryptographic flaw and then they had like turned that into a challenge and you're supposed to basically read the paper and then implement the attack uh, towards the challenge. So that's also a quite common uh, type of um, challenge within the cryptography um, category. And uh, yeah, so this means that, <coughs> yeah, there, there, you might need to do a lot of reading while solving these challenges. Uh, but as I said, there is a, like tons of materials. And then uh, while solving these challenges, there will be a lot of calculations uh, done typically. So there's a really nice uh, like programming framework called SageMath, uh, which uh, uh, allows you to do like a ton of different uh, math math mathematical operations. So you can, you know, have have everything. Uh, okay, we're back. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it's like a, a, a nice uh, programming framework. It's like it's Python based, but it's not actually Python, but it's pretty much Python. Uh, 
So yeah, if you know Python, you know SageMath. Um, and again, there will be scripting. You might want to, you know, try to. You need to brute force a little bit. Like you, you, you do some, um, you know, analysis of the algorithm, and you figure out that actually it can only be like one of these ten million possibilities. And you write the program to try those ten million possibilities, and uh, you find the uh, the flag. So that would require some some programming. Um, we. Yeah, never mind. Um, so this is the cryptography uh, category. Uh, forensics is um, another category of, of uh, uh, challenges, and uh, basically it's about finding finding data, uh, and it can be, you know, very, you know, the typical thing that you would think about when you think about like uh, IT forensics. So maybe you would get the disk image, and then somewhere on this disk image there is some kind of uh, data that has been maybe some kind of file that has been deleted, or uh, you need to do some kind of log analysis to figure out what has happened, and then from that you can uh, derive uh, the flag. Uh, it can also be uh, on a network level. You might get the uh, recording of network traffic, and by looking at this network traffic, uh, you're supposed to figure out what has happened. Maybe in the middle of this, there is a file being transferred, and this is a category which is um, quite often combined with other uh, categories. So, for example, the reverse engineering category and forensics category uh, very often are like coupled together. You might get kind of like a, something that looks like some malware uh, sample and some recorded traffic. So you have some malware which has communicated with the command and control uh, server. So by both looking at the actual code and the recorded traffic, Maybe by looking at the code, you're able to decrypt the recorded traffic, and then from that you might get uh, out the flag. So that's also a very common uh, setup. Sometimes it's about uh, different file formats where they have like hidden data in file formats. So it might be like you hide from very simple things as hiding something in the comment of a JPEG file um, to uh, more uh, complicated. Uh, setups where you have different pieces of file formats uh, which are actually not really used, and you hide files, uh, hide data there, uh, which is um, requires you to get an understanding of these file formats to figure out like w what part of this file is like the file, like the result I'm seeing, and what parts of this could be something interesting, and and so on. Um, yeah, so it's. Could be a, sometimes a really nice uh, category to uh, look at. You can also have uh, like memory dumps, so like a full memory capture of a of a machine, uh, and you're supposed to like analyze this uh, memory dump to find like processes running and files stored in in memory of that machine and uh, recover something from that. So um, yeah, sometimes this is very similar to the work like an incident responder or IT forensics uh, person would do. Um, like in a real engagement, and so this is these are like the standard categories that you would find, you know, in in, in most uh, competitions uh, or at least a subset uh, of them. But then there are um, challenges that doesn't really fit into one of these uh, standard categories, which are usually just thrown into like a miscellaneous uh, category, uh, something that has been. Uh, you know that we've seen multiple times is like the DSP, so digital signal processing. So you might get some kind of radio wave uh, recording, uh, and you're supposed to decode the signal. So it, it might be, I mean, from from something very simple like uh, some like Morse code or uh, FM radio uh, signal to uh, more complicated, um, you know, signal processing uh, challenges. Uh, we have seen like uh, recently uh, some machine learning uh, challenges. So uh, a common setup there is that you have like a, uh, a classifier, like a neural net classifier. So it's kind of like the same setup as the uh, reverse engineering track me that you're supposed to, to give it an image with the flag, and it's, the classifier will say yes, this is the flag. But you're only given the the model of the neural net, and then by analyzing it, you can work your way backwards to see what image would trigger. The yes output of this uh, neural network. 
Uh, recently, like smart contracts, like Ethereum and things like that, have been uh, popular. And sometimes it's more general, like programming task, where you're supposed to automate something or so solve some algorithmic uh, challenge, um, similar to you know regular uh, competitive programming uh, challenges. If anyone has you know tried that out, um, yeah. So uh, a kind of new category that has been popping up like the last year or something uh, has been like kind of like unofficially named uh, Sajbiste. I think that's a, roughly how it's pronounced, which is uh, Polish for uh, awesome, kind of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that's, that's not a literal translation, but let's say it's, it's a translation. Basically, this is a category where uh, the challenge is you're supposed to find a zero day. Uh, so an unknown or not publicly known vulnerability uh, in um, in some kind of software. So, uh, for example, there was uh, one Capture the Fight competition at the CCC conference in, in Germany uh, at the end of last year. And they had this category where basically uh, one of the challenges was, for example, some uh, uh, PHP um, CMS uh, framework. So one of the this framework, which was undisclosed and they just put this version of the framework up and you were supposed to find the same vulnerability as they have found. Uh, they also had some vulnerability in the uh, Keybase desktop client. So Keybase is uh, it's a service for like sharing PGP keys and there's some messaging thing and some file sharing thing as well they've built on top of that. So they have a desktop client which had a, some kind of bug which they found. Uh, which hadn't been disclosed, and that was put up as a challenge of the of the CTF. Uh, and the fun thing was that the Keybase patched the challenge, patched their program during the competition. So the organizers had to add a disclaimer, like "Do not upgrade to the latest version because you will not be able to solve the challenge." <laughs> so this is typically a difficult category. Uh, I mean, not always. So apparently, this like the PHP uh, CMS thing, uh, it was basically. Uh, going to the right page and running an automated tool against it, and you would find uh, the vulnerability. So it's not always difficult, but it's typically uh, difficult. Yeah, so these are the kind of the, the, the different fields that you would find. Uh, and as I mentioned before, there are like two primary formats that this is played in. So the by far most common way that you have is, is the uh, Jeopardy style. Uh, and one reason for that is that it's mm, very simple to organize. You create a set of independent challenges, you put them in categories, uh, you either have like a static scoring where you, as an organizer, assign a score to each challenge. This was what was always done previously, but in the last few years, uh, a lot of organizers have started adopting kind of like a dynamic scoring system where every challenge starts out being worth the same. Uh, amount and uh, the more teams uh, solve it, the less uh, points it gets worth, uh, but also retroactively. So basically, it doesn't matter when you solve it during the competition as long as you solve it before the end. But basically, you look at the categories, you look at the challenges, you pick a, ch uh, a challenge in the category you want, you solve it, you get the flag, you submit the flag, you get the points, and you repeat this until the competition ends. Um, so very simple, very accessible, easy to participate, easy to organize. The other format is the attack defense uh, format. And this is, uh, um, this is, I mean, so these Jeopardy style competitions, there are basically challenge, uh, competitions every weekend throughout the year. There are like hundreds of competitions throughout the year. But the attack defense, uh, there are like a handful or like 10 of them uh, throughout the year because they are much more difficult to organize. But the basic idea is that every team get a server or some kind of setup. Every team gets the an identical setup. Uh, so let's say one server each. And uh, these servers are running a bunch of uh, services uh, which all have one or more vulnerabilities on them. So your goal as a team is to find these vulnerabilities fix them on your own server and develop exploits and attack the other team's uh, servers with these exploits. And you also have to make sure that your services are up and running at all times because there will be a, 
uh, like a judge system, which will try to connect to your services and interact with them. So if we had these uh, like library thing, for example, there, there would be like a bot connecting and trying to like borrowing and returning books uh, to making sure that you know your service is actually up and running and working as uh, intended. Uh, so you need to fix the vulnerabilities, attack your uh, the other teams, and try to kind of even if you maybe not have fully patched your services, you can still try to block their attempts of exploiting it. So analyzing the traffic into your server in real time and creating firewall rules and uh, things like that. So it kind of gets a little bit like, you know, in, in, in movies and TV series when they have these hacking scenes and it's like, oh my God, uh, he's in the firewall. It's, and yeah, that's basically what it's like playing these uh, attack defense uh, competitions. So it, it's a little bit more uh, intense uh, feels a little bit movie-like. And this is something, a uh, kind of uh, category where it really helps if your team has like built and developed different kind of tools uh, beforehand and when doing this. So you have tools for patching your progress because typically you don't get access to the source code. So you can't not just um, edit the source code and compile the programs. Again, you have to uh, patch them in the compiled version, so like replace bytes in the correct places to make the program not be uh, vulnerable anymore. So you can have tools for that. You can have tools for setting up things like firewall rules and uh, tools for automatically like uh, sending the same exploit to all to all of your uh, opponents and, and so on. Uh, so it's it's a bit more it's much more difficult to organize. It's a bit more difficult to well not participate but to be successful in uh, it. it Requires, you know, doing it a bunch of time to get this, get some experience and, you know, work up a way of like doing this. And it really helps to be a team uh, where you can like split up responsibilities. Uh, some, then there are like other kinds of CTF uh, formats, uh, different kind of like what do you call like uh, cyber quests or scenarios or things where maybe you don't have like a single challenge, but more like you have. A network which is supposed to kind of emulate like a real uh, target where you're supposed to like jump from machine to machine and uh, it's maybe not exactly about you know which path you take or exactly what service you exploit and so on but it might be you know more about the process some of these uh, are performed as uh, more of like a subjective uh, judging so you you work on this as a team and then you kind of like give some kind of presentations and you have like a jury and they, they're like all kinds of different other formats but these are like extremely rare so so i mean the jeopardy style is by far the most common the attack defense is like the second but it's way 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 less common than the jeopardy style and these are like you know maybe a bunch of them per year or typically in more done in closed uh, contexts like within you know, as uh, as training for a company or some, you know, military exercise or things like that. But yeah, I'm just mentioning this because there are not only two these two uh, formats basically. So uh, I have described what uh, these CTFs uh, are, and uh, uh, so why why should you uh, bother with this? And uh, one thing is that it's it's really really educational. You learn a lot of stuff by doing this. I would estimate that about eighty percent of my technical security skills come from playing uh, CTF competitions, uh, and it's very nice because you have all of these different areas and you play these maybe like Jeopardy style competitions, and you can like choose if you want to focus on okay it's like i'm really good at reverse engineering so this this time i'm really going to go for the reverse engineering challenges and like solve this really difficult reverse engineering challenge or you might choose to you know uh widen your skill set so maybe you're really good at reverse engineering but you're not really that good at cryptography so you go for like the easier cryptography challenges and uh you mean you hopefully you learn something uh, new and one thing that's very common is that after these competitions, a lot of uh, players and teams, they uh, create write-ups where they explain how they've solved uh, a certain uh, challenge. So maybe you attempt a challenge during the competition. Uh, maybe you, you do succeed, but in a very you know, suboptimal way, it takes you a very long time, or maybe you don't even succeed at all. And then you can read one of these write-ups afterwards and see how other people with maybe more experience and more knowledge solve that challenge. And that's also a way uh, of learning. It's also really 
like fun and competitive to play in this competition. So it really, I mean, kind of like exploits the uh, like human uh, psyche and have this like really nice feedback loop where you attempt this challenge and you put a lot of effort and then you finally solve it and get the flag. Uh, and I mean, I've been multiple times in a situation where, you know, you're sitting late some evening, you're trying to really, you're trying hard to solve this challenge. It's, it's getting a bit late. Then you think like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to finish this challenge. You push yourself, uh, and you manage to solve it and you get these like really, uh, boost and you think like, Oh yeah, maybe I'm just gonna look a little bit at this next challenge before I go to bed, and I can think about it while I'm sleeping. And then suddenly it's like 4 a.m. Uh, and you don't know what happened. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's that's uh, like the addictive component of, of playing CTS, which is really good. Like you you trick yourself into learning a lot of cool stuff. Also, playing together with a team is a really nice like social uh, activity. And also, most of these uh, competitions they are played online. But typically you have, some of these competitions are qualifiers for an on-site event. So, for example, um, two weeks ago, uh, we went to Korea uh, and played a uh, competition there. So we played a qualifier back in March, and we managed to uh, get like seventh place or something. So we qualified to these finals in uh, South Korea, and we went there and played in this uh, final. So there we got to meet uh, some of the other teams and, you know, talk to them uh, and... That was a, was a really nice thing. Yes. Was it North or South? South Korea. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So um, we'll see. Um, I. Yeah. Actually, I can just give like one like super simple example of, of like a web challenge. What what this could look like. But then I think we are actually out of time. So this is uh, from something called uh, Pico uh, CDF which is a high school uh, CDF uh, organized every year. It's a US competition. So it's a web challenge. Uh, you get some, they have it's uh, a list of Irish uh, people there, a website. Um, okay. And uh, uh, you can press the menu. There's some port. It's like admin login. Yeah, that looks interesting. So you get to, hopefully, assuming I still have some kind of internet connection. Uh, yes, you get to this login page. And, you know, we might try something really stupid like admin, admin, <laughs> uh, which didn't work. Okay, so uh, what what could this be? Uh, possibly it could be um, a SQL injection uh, vulnerability. That was something you would try out when you see a, a login page. So, um, I mean, there will be, I think in May you will have some uh, things around the web exploitation so i mean i'm not going to go too deep into in, into that but basically if you do like a standard uh, school book uh 1a sql injection uh thing uh that would log in and this uh when you get the flag and you would submit this uh so this is like you know a very very basic web challenge so this is where you start out and then it builds upon uh, from this. And then I would take this and go to the Pico CTF um, scoring system. I would submit this and I would be awarded uh, the points. So this is like, you know, really the, you know, the introductory challenge. Uh, and then it can get crazy uh, difficult uh, from there, which we don't have time to uh, show today. But uh, I hope now that I have, you know, inspired you and convinced you that it's a good idea. Uh, so, uh, one thing that you should check out is this Pico CTF. So it is, it is a, a capture the flag competition that is run pretty much every year. Uh, it's a high school uh, competition, so it's oriented towards uh, beginners. But it's really well made because like it starts out like really, really, really simple. Uh, but then it progresses, and towards the end, like the the most difficult challenges uh, in that is comparable to like a medium difficulty challenge uh, of a regular uh, CTF competition. It has like a really nice curve and they even have like a support forum for, you know, asking things about these uh, challenges. And what they do is typically they run this for like two weeks, the actual competition, but then they leave the website and all the challenges up and running uh, throughout the year. So the competition was in like October or something, but this website is still up with all the challenges running. So you can go to picoctf.com, register and uh, yeah, work on these challenges. Uh, another site is ctftime.org, which is 
like a competition calendar and kind of unofficial world ranking for all the, all the teams. So when you participate, if you register your team there, when you participate in these challenges or these competitions, uh, you will be awarded ranking points throughout the year. Uh, and this is in this ranking that we are currently ranked uh, number 12. 11. 11 now, nice. It changes. Um, there's another thing called the uh, OWASP uh, juice shop, which is like a capture flag in a box. Uh, it's like a Docker image or virtual machine that you can download. And it's like a website which is vulnerable in all kinds of different ways. You can exploit it uh, in many different ways and try to solve these uh, challenges. If you're into these uh, the Ponables, the low-level exploitation, there's a really nice site called Ponable.kr, which is a Korean uh, site which is like a, a curated collection of Ponable challenges from a lot of different competitions and contexts uh, previously. So they have like handpicked uh, a good mix of them, uh, which uh, follows a nice progression where in the, the, the easier ones, they kind of like introduce one concept at a time and then the trickier ones, yeah, get really tricky. Uh, there is a, a website called overthewire.org, which is a bit dated by now, but uh, it has some really good uh, introductory challenges and a good mix of stuff, and it's kind of like a classic uh, in the scene. So it has some really nice uh, challenges, even though you know some of the concepts are uh, a bit dated by now, but still teaches you uh, some fundamental uh, principles of this. And yeah, with that, that's it for for me. Thank you.